Hi, everyone, and welcome to the fifth real lecture of 2020. We hope you're ready for another thought-provoking lecture. Firstly, we would like to acknowledge the Wadharang people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Tonight's guest is Mick Maloney from Maloney Architects. Co-founder Mick Maloney is a registered architect with degrees in both architecture and construction management. He's worked in the industry for 20 years, delivering high-end architectural projects throughout Victoria. Mick will be taking us through a lecture entitled Re-Urbanism versus Godzilla as part of this trimester's theme of sustainability, taking a look at how architects can help create socially sustainable cities by reimagining existing buildings and the significant forces that stand in the way. Before we get started, as this is possibly the first lecture for many of our visitors tonight, I'll explain who we are and why we do these lectures. So the real lectures are a series of student organized industry lectures featuring practicing architects and industry professionals. The real lectures have been running at Deakin University for over 10 years. Um, and were established to pursue engaging topical and thought provoking architectural discourse between those in the field and those studying. As architecture students or those simply interested in architecture, we are aware of the surface level discussion in a lot of architectural media and in the general public. The curation of the Real Lecture series aims to explore beyond the surface level discussion and instead investigate the why, delving into a deeper conversation about the built environment. You can stay up to date with us on our Facebook and Instagram and on our blog. And if you'd like to see more of the Real Lectures, you can find our previously recorded lectures on our Facebook page and blog. Now, without further ado, I'll hand over to Mick. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Katie. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Mick Maloney from Maloney Architects. Um, I'm the co-founder with my wife, Jules Maloney. Um, and uh, we've got quite a few slides tonight, so uh, we, we should get stuck into it. So I'll, uh, I'll start the screen share and, uh, and we'll go from there. All right, all good. Um, yeah, so welcome to this this real lecture. This is the third time I've um, been asked to by the students to take in to um, talk uh, about our work and uh, practice in in uh, in the real world. And I think it's a wonderful initiative, um, and it's great to see uh, passionate students um, such as uh, Katie and Robbie and Aaron um, who are. Uh, taking up that mantle and uh, organising these these uh, engagements with the the working architectural community. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about um, our colourfully sort of uh, introduced reurbanism reurbanism versus Godzilla. Um, the title is a sort of uh, as a deliberately provocative, deliberately sort of um, uh, trying to engage uh, a little bit and and, and uh, spark a bit of curiosity. Um, and uh, the first thing we're going to be talking about is well, you know, what have we been talking about by reurbanism um, and uh, uh, Godzilla and the uh, the forces that stand in the way of um, this idea of reurbanism. Um, then we're just going to take a quick look about uh, at who we are uh, as architects um, practicing in regional Victoria, um, and then uh, that will key nicely into our first case study, which is the wooden box house, which is. Uh, me and Jules's house. Um, we will then sort of talk about where we live, which is the city of Ballarat, and uh, some case studies of some projects that we've completed um, of late um, that have been uh, successful within this sort of reurbanism context. The, the the latter part of the lecture is going to sort of move on to um, reurbanism and adaptive reuse precedents. Um, it's interesting that um, you know, in a lot of documentation you read about reurbanism, um, we were reading uh, this guide to Ballarat 2040 the other day, and it said, um, "Look at these great examples of reurbanism." And an old Ballarat pub has been turned into a new Ballarat pub, um, and I would say that's a renovation, uh, not quite adaptive reuse. Uh, so, we uh, we're going to look at some real examples of of adaptive reuse. Um, and then bring that home with uh, a, a small project that we worked on for uh, Green Magazine, which uh, who invited us to participate in a uh, urban design uh, ideas competition last year. Um, and then uh, the final 
case study which we're entitling What If Ballarat? So re-urbanism, um, I'm just going to start a timer because I, I'm, <laughs> with so many slides, I just don't want to uh, be in a position where I'm massively uh, running out of time. One moment. Um, so re-urbanism. This, um, we're sort of searching wide, far and wide for a really good um, uh, definition or, or a, an explanation of what it, of what reurbanism is, um, and this one we just thought was really really beautiful. That the you know the, the fundamental part of um, why we should be you know considering reurbanism is that um, the cities cities grow and they change, um, and then we really want to um, make the most of the the assets that we already have, uh, and it keys in really well to the. Uh, the theme of these lectures, which is broadly sustainability. And that's why we've got sustainable underlined in uh, with the emphasis that we've added into that uh, final paragraph. Um, and, you know, the, the, way, the way that this is written is ultimately it's the mix of old and new buildings working together to fashion dense, walkable and thriving streets that helps us achieve a more prosperous, sustainable and healthier future. Um, and that's something that we've really uh, been thinking of, of late um, of, about the city of Ballarat. Um, and how that densification uh, could could work, and how uh, we can sort of all contribute uh, in the architectural community to trying to um, uh, improve that that city centre. Um, and then the other part of the title uh, is the is versus Godzilla, and the Godzillas are the um, the things that that stand in our way it's kind of this sort of neat uh, umbrella term uh, that we use around the office for uh things that like um uh, the, the 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 hurdles the the struggles that we have when we're um trying to uh, engage in a in a re um reorganization or a um uh, adaptive reuse project the economic Godzilla um, is pretty self-explanatory. You know, a lot of these projects where we're trying to use uh, existing building stock uh, are very expensive and very difficult to predict the cost of. So we'll talk about that a little bit through the case studies and uh, what it is as, a, as an economic Godzilla um, uh, and, and what that can sort of mean to the architectural outcomes. Um, the big Godzilla in the middle, heritage and planning controls. Um, that's one that in working in a city like Ballarat, uh, it's it's the it's one of our biggest um, uh, opposing forces to creating new architecture. Um, but it's a Godzilla that uh, you, you have to work with, and um, and we'll talk about that later on too. Uh, and then the third and, and final uh, and sort of one of the most sort of complex uh, Godzillas that we work with is the the notion of inflexibility uh, and, as well as inertia. And that's really about sort of community attitudes and uh, and the idea that the the past was somehow better than the future, and uh, and that uh, buildings and places should remain unchanged. Uh, and that's something that we find is um, uh, perhaps the one of the the, the biggest sort of structural uh, Godzillas that we we come across in practice. So just a, a little bit about us. Um, we live uh, in Ballarat. Um, I, I started the company with my wife, Jules, um, and uh, we studied together in uh, architecture school back at Deakin when we started in 1999. Um, so yes, many, many years later, I mean, jobs and uh, different career paths, we um, finally formed our studio in 2007. And uh, we bought this place uh, on Sturt Street, which is the main street of Ballarat. Um, it's fairly common in Ballarat to have professional offices off operating out of um, heritage, old heritage places, um, because the, the town's grown quite a bit, but the, um, the, the, the inner area is still filled with a lot of uh, red brick and weatherboard cottages. We have a team of six. Um, some of them work from home some days, some of them come in other days. Uh, but yeah, usually it's a sort of four or five of us around the studio in that front room there. So that's the, that window there is that window out back there. Uh, and we work around one big table. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we're uh, a, a small but productive team. Um, the wooden box house is the first case study that I wanted to talk about in or our sort of small city reurbanism uh, example. So that's a, an aerial photograph of Ballarat. You've got um, downtown Ballarat over here, Lake Wendery towards the end, um, towards the 
northwest. Uh, and then this street that goes through the middle is called Sturt Street. So our studio is on Sturt Street here. Um, and that was the reason why we purchased this property. Um, so just zooming into that space, space there, um, you can see that it's quite a, a long, narrow block. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a great spot to have an office. We've got, you know, plenty of free parking out the front. There's um, a lot of walking traffic going past um, shops, going up to the lake. And um, it's, it's, an, it's a really great address to, to function, um, to, to, to operate from. Um, as you can see, though, the um, the front part or the front part of the property um, for our small studio, we really only needed a, a, a group working uh, space over here, and then a meeting space over here, and a bit of storage running along there. Um, the that kind of left us on this 450 square meter block with about 400 square meters of vacant land um, with uh, various sort of little. Um, uh, lean twos and extensions that were on, on the back um, here from the 1930s and uh, 80s. Um, so rather than sort of just keep this as an office and then uh, buy a house out of town, we, we decided that we we would try living in town um, and we built our house, which we call the wooden box house. Um, so reusing the 1930s um, part of the house that was a previous extension, um, the original parts probably, uh, we think it's about 1905, 1910. Um, and then uh, we changed that area into um, bedrooms and bathrooms and then uh, attached a small wooden box, which was the uh, sort of start, you know, the, the scale and um, uh, size of uh, extension that we could afford at the time when we did the project. Um, we call it the wooden box house. Uh, the media uh, over in the States, there's this uh, uh, blog called uh, Design Milk and they, they call it the mullet house because it's uh, business at the front and party at the back, which uh, <laughs> we're hoping doesn't catch on. We prefer wooden box. Thanks very much. So um, this is just a, a good little example because it does explain like, I'll, I would say, you know, the vast majority, 80% of our work in, in Ballarat is either um, residential new or residential um, alterations and additions projects. And one of our sort of guiding philosophies when we're dealing with these older buildings is to really to, um, to try to leave uh, things that are working uh, well enough alone. And um, you can see in the, um, the the front half of the house here, we've got the, the older 1910s bus, we've got the 1930s edition, and uh, that was sort of all built under this one big uh, truss roof structure, or, sorry, solid frame roof structure. Um, we, for the contemporary part, we've actually added that on using what we call basically an architectural shadow line. And that um, that allows us to leave the existing uh, roof structure and guttering in, intact. Um, and, uh, and what it means is that we know we never really try to extend the uh, the existing roof structure to create a, um, a, a new part of the building that is um, pretending to be in any way sort of like the old, you know. It's like sometimes when you see these um, uh, places that are, are designed in sort of a heritage style and they feature prominently with a, a double garage on the front of it, like a, like that ever existed. So we want to try and avoid that. Um, this is the the back, the mullet of the, 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 <laughs> the wooden box house uh, and the um, the the north facing backyard area. So this is my family. There's my girls back when they were a bit younger. Uh, that's Jules there um, with our sliding mirror that covers the TV. That's Jules again walking through into the house. And um, so that's yeah our our everyday living area. That's the photographer's assistant because uh, I wasn't deemed photogenic enough to be sitting there reading a book. Um, there I am, I'm blurry in the background, but. Uh, yeah, so this is um, uh, a, a project that really is indicative of, of what um, the sort of projects, you know, th th this is the sort of house that you can create with a, a lovely old building. Um, and uh, you can have the best of both worlds in terms of a um, charming uh, cottage at the front, which is what Ballarat's kind of famous for, and then uh, to have a really contemporary uh, addition at the rear. In terms of the Godzillas, um, we we really um, had no no problems here. We had no um, uh, problems from uh, in inflexibility and inertia, and that's really because it was our own house. Um, we didn't we didn't see that there were um, any sort of status quo. There was no um, for us. It wasn't terribly important to to retain the outhouse in the back of the building or to. Um, uh, to, to, to preserve the, 
the, the layers of uh, history from some, some of the sort of more crappy building elements that were out the back. Um, we did, however, um, encounter the Economics Godzilla and the Heritage and Planning Control Godzilla. Um, so uh, from an economic point of view, uh, it was a very low cost project. We had to do a lot with um, some very basic materials, which you can see in some of the um, images. We've used things like form fly and, uh, and plywood and uh, low, low cost materials, but I think in, a, in an interesting sort of way. Um, and then heritage and planning uh, was, uh, was was sort of a bit of a baptism of fire to, to, to do our own project in the city of Ballarat and be pulled up for the uh, the lack of a uh, heritage paint colour on the capping of the uh, carport at the back of the laneway, um, which if you look down the laneway, it's just a, you know, a bunch of crappy old sheds. Um, but that's uh, that's the, that was the um, city of Ballarat's uh, only problem with what we had proposed. Um, so when we said, um, yeah, that the proposed colour is black and there's plenty of black in the city of Ballarat, uh, we, we got it through. Um, so I, I, I sometimes bitch and moan about Ballarat, but I, I do love it. It's, it's a great city. And um, the, the first thing I'll just point out is that it's not Bendigo, uh, despite what everybody says. Uh, Bendigo is a sort of bit further north uh, and we're a bit further west. Uh, the city of Ballarat is growing Quite substantially, um, even some sort of you know in the last ten years or so, um, it's it's heading towards. I think it's going to be around about 120, 125 by, by the end of the year. Um, this is just an aerial photograph uh, looking out over the city. We've got um, uh, really it's it's uh, it's pretty sprawling as a city. The the, the inner city, but uh, of it obviously in the centre here. Um, you can see there's a commercial zone in here. There's quite a lot of um, older housing in this area here around the lake. The more um, affluent sort of suburbs are in around here in Lake Wendouree and, and Central Ballarat. Um, and then there's a lot of um, larger uh, housing estates that are popping up and, and, and continuing to grow out onto the borders. A uh, classic thing that people talk about Ballarat is it's old, cold and gold. Um, so it was established in the 1830s, which makes it quite a, an old um, town. Uh, gold was discovered in the 1850s. So there was this huge amount, huge influx of wealth uh, in the, in the um, 1800s. Um, so there are buildings here that wouldn't be out of place in, in Collins Street. And um, it's just, you know, this sort of a, a, a quirky thing for a, for a, a relatively small town to have such incredible architecture. Um, and it's cold, it's bloody cold. We're at um, 430 or so uh, metres above sea level. Uh, it, it snows pretty much reliably every year. Uh, a lot of people know Ballarat from the um, Sovereign Hill and um, that's one of our biggest uh, draw cards in the area. Um, it, but it does give this sort of sense that Ballarat is in some ways kind of uh, a little bit of an extension of this theme park um, I think a lot of people don't realise that none of this is real. It's 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 a recreation. It's you know, uh, it was I think it started in the seventies or eighties or something like that. But it's done so authentically and, and so well that um, it does really um, to, you know gives the gives that sense that it is uh, like a one of those sort of US ghost towns that have been somehow miraculously recovered. Um, the the real city of Ballarat is um, you know it's it's similar. You know there there are. Um, you know, it's of, it's of its time, of, of this sort of period in the 1850s, um, or a, a, a this gold rush wealth um, sort of city. But uh, it's it's all real. You know, this is this is um, you know quite an incredible city. This isn't a, a view that uh, that exists. This is just a, a, a photo montage. I just went through my uh, phone and found a bunch of images of uh, some Ballarat buildings that I love, um, and then I'm I'm sort of collecting to to do some sketches of. But um, uh, the, the, you know, all these incredible buildings are just, um, you know, 500 or metres or so away from, from our office. Um, this one in particular is my favourite one in Ballarat. It's, um, it's got this sort of um, um, Venetian sort of uh, facade on it, which is actually just an absolute delight to go and, and sketch. The other sort of uh, thing that's very famous in Ballarat is uh, cottages. This is uh, my wife Jules's uh, parents' house, and um, it's been in their family for I think it's 150 years or something like that. Um, so Jules is an original Ballarat person. I'm I'm not uh, originally, but um, it's nice to call this place home. Um, it's not just old buildings. Um, we've got a new um, uh, John Wardle designed Gov Hub. It's going up in the centre of town. 
Um, the we have uh, there's another John Water building there. It's a beautiful home on the on looking out onto Lake Lake Wendouree. Um And then you know there's a smattering of some other interesting um, uh, contemporary pieces like um, uh, Elliot's um, glass house in the in the botanical gardens and um, Peter Elliot's um, building there. The, the change is quite stark. This is a Eugene von Gorard uh, painting from the 1850s um, about the Ballarat settlement. So you can see it's just basically minus tense um, at that point there. And then uh, fast forward 150, 170 years and uh, we're uh, at um, peak sprawl at the moment. This is our second case study. Um, and uh, let's see how we're going to get time. Good. Um, it's the Max Roberts Electrical Building, um, which sold uh, to some fr uh, friends of ours, the Mitchells and the Harris family, who um, have combined together to create a, uh, a winery called Mitchell Harris. Very clever name. Um, this is what we walked into when they asked us to come and have a look at the building. And um, we we're like, whoa, that's a, that's a bit of work to do there. Um, and uh, the you know it was a it was a motor winding uh, shop so you can still see there's electrical motors and that sort of thing still sitting there and and just um, years and years of, of of machinery and uh, and supplies they used to put the this is like a hoist that runs through the middle of the building where they they put um, these heavy electric motors on and actually sort of winch them through into there to work on them and then back out onto trucks. Um, yes, yeah, so the building was pretty well, um, you know, buggered after the, all these interventions that had happened, various floors, you know, the, there was a story about the, a, a truck that had pulled into here and the, the top of it didn't fit through um, able to, to come into the to the loading area here. So they just cut into the door frame. Um, so there's this neat little hole at the top of it. Um, so we get that. <laughs> um, it was interesting that, you know, once the, the, um, the Mitchell Harris crew had sort of started cleaning up, um, people realised that it was actually a bit of a gem. And, um, you know, in its cleaned up state, people were starting to ask to have their wedding photos done in this space. So we, we kind of knew that there, there was a, there's a beautiful sort of atmosphere to this building um, and something that we didn't want to really um, interfere with too much as we proposed the design solution. So this is the um, the concept render that we gave to uh, Mitchell Harris guys, and um, you can see we've got um, uh, they at the start it was called an urban cellar door. I'm not really sure if they still call it that anymore, but it was um, it was designed to be this sort of multi-purpose thing where you could have uh, in this central bar space here, um, you can be servicing a bottle shop uh, on the side there, or people having sitting down for drinks here, or um, there's there's John uh, doing a tasting uh, at the other end of the bar. So um, we came up with this concept of, uh, of this central sort of pod, and it allowed basically one person to operate from this central point of service, uh, and they could operate the, the bottle shop, the the sit down drinks area and the tastings um, uh, if they needed to. Um, and that's and that's a small business sort of thing. Often you think, oh, well, I'm gonna start this business and I'll, and I'll make sure it's as lean as possible because um, you know you don't know if it's gonna be successful. Anyway, I think they've got like 20 or 40 staff or something now. It's absolutely bonkers. It's become a Ballarat institution. Um, there's, um, you know, everybody knows Ballarat, Mitchell Harris Wines and it's, uh, it's become this uh, juggernaut. And whenever I'm going out in Ballarat, this is the first place I go to, it's just beautiful. Um, so you can see here we've uh, we've kept the the steel uh, beams and we've still kept that connection to that um, that steel um, uh, hoist area that was the, the, the motors used to travel through. But then it's become sort of part of the, the new language of the bar, um, and uh, we've I think we've retained a lot of the the industrial feel for this. Um, I'll talk about the Godzillas for this project uh, a bit later on, but um, one of them eh, that we, we didn't come up against was was this inertia from clients and and, and that and that sort of inflexibility that idea um, that that or oh, we don't really want to do that. that that might be doing too much or or, or we're scared um, these guys were incredible clients they were um, uh, they were they were into every idea of of, um, of ours and they brought their own ideas to the table. Um, and uh, and even things that we we joked we actually took a uh, a picture of John um, that that we we um, seen on their Instagram or something and then uh, and turned it into a piece of street art and then thought you know what we could do to sort of create this interior that's you know trying to recall a little bit that Melbourne laneway sort of feel 
Um, and uh, and it was sort of a bit of a joke. We put it out there, but um, uh, they ended up commissioning an artist called Bexter to create this um, this incredible artwork um, on the wall um, in basically the same location. And we um, it, it brings a you know absolute smile to, to my face every time I see it because um, it, it's this idea that architects you know can have a little bit of influence there. We can even suggest things as as off the off the wall as, as an artwork, um, and uh, and sometimes those ideas land. Um, and and look, this is this has become you know uh, a, a one of the attractions of the of the space as well. Um, so we do a lot of visualization work um, in the office. We do um, we try to show people a pretty good idea of what their building's going to look like. This is back in our um, very early days before we were really sort of getting uh, a lot more sophisticated with our 3D work. Um, but all we really wanted to show with this is that the building's pretty well perfect as it is. You know, we just needed to fix up the signage um, and, um, and then keep the, the old um, painted, um, you know, electric motors uh, signage on the front um, and it, it would add to its charm. And that's exactly what they've done. So you can still see the original uh, text on the front of the building there. Um, we've got a very uh, basic paired back um, signage and then um, you know the building's you know been repaired there's a, there's a new roof but it's all essentially we're trying to, to, to retain its character. So when we talk about the Godzillas for this project we um, we definitely didn't have any inflexibility or inertia. We had really progressive really um, uh, I, I think brave clients that, that really wanted to create something um, interesting and uh, uh, authentic and um, uh, it's not the experience that we've had with other um, hospitality clients you know there's a, there's a temptation in hospitality work to be um, to sort of follow the trends a little bit um, and uh, and you know you can end up with a fairly sanitized um, environment and I, and I don't think that's the case here I think we've come up with something that that really feels like a, a, an old part of the city that has had this you know this new use sort of inserted into that space um, and that that attraction and and, and that um, I, I think people sort of come to that space to to see the the old building itself as much as they hopefully become to taste the wine um, economics and, and planning control the that were the big Godzillas of this project I mean the the, there's so there's only so much architecture that you can produce on on a tiny budget um, and uh, again a, a lot of projects that we we took on uh, in our first 10 years of the practice were um, uh, you know suffered at the, under the hands of the economic Godzilla and um, we really I think um, it's kind of hones your skills in some ways and it's probably one of the reasons why a lot of architects who start off doing low project uh, low value projects um, do end up, uh, you know, it's necessity is the mother of invention. You know, you you, you really need to um, uh, hone your skills when there's not that much money uh, available. Um, and then the heritage and planning controls um, were a big one for this one as well. Uh, again, it, it sort of, uh, a lot of our experience as architects kind of um, getting into um, projects in Ballarat uh, have really tried have really sort of revealed the character of of the city in a way and and the underlying sort of conservative attitudes that that we the Ballarat community has has to heritage and planning control um, so we had things you know there's there's a lot of um, control over of liquor licensing and um, that sort of thing from a from a bigger project point of view but also um, uh, you know things like you know making sure that the the, the type of roofing is galvanized iron instead of zinc loom and um, very particular things that um, you know in an old industrial building in another context wouldn't matter but in Ballarat these things are, are, are meticulously um, uh, with meticulous oversight and and uh, and there are people who who very much feel very passionately about it um, and so, and as a bit more background on, on who we are and what we're doing over here, um, this is another project, uh, Webster Street House. Um, this one is uh, a project that wasn't um, 
too badly impacted by the economic Godzilla. So it probably sort of shows the other end of what we do. Um, so, you know, a project like Mitchell Harris is in the, you know, the low couple of hundred thousands, whereas a project in this one is in the low millions as a, um, uh, as a, as a guide. Um, the original buildings, one of Ballarat's you know, beautiful old red brick uh, structures. Um, it's got a, um, uh, a veranda that runs around the front and um, classic um, heritage colours that they uh, used to call it in Ballarat. Um, the, I'm going to have to go a bit quicker. We're already at 25 minutes and I'm at slide about 20 of 140. So I'm going to pick up the pace. All right. So this is the uh, Webster Street house. Lovely old brick thing at the back. Um, and then just a ridiculous amount of, of stuff here. This bit was sort of worth keeping the red bit. bit. Uh, the rest of it from here, these little additions and, you know, it looked like a sauna in here. This is very funny. Um, different architectural language. Huge granny flat wing with garage um, in there and this big rumpus room out the back um, and then this giant driveway that just souped around so you know, these weird little things out the back and then um, this granny flat and then um, uh, car parking out the back so that you could reverse uh, the cars you know, out from here and then shoot out frontwards. But what it had the effect of doing was taking this family home and then completely dis you know, disassociating the backyard, which is over here, from the, the house. So the first thing we kind of realised that we had to do was to, um, uh, was to take the car, take the garage uh, and put it on the side of the house. So we ended up putting the, the garage over here um, and that um, basically allowed us to come up with this this 3D image, so you can see our, our 3D work slightly improving from the Mitchell Harris days. Um, and uh, we've got out the back here, the, the garage, which is, you know, you now have to drive in and then reverse back out. Nice big wide driveway, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you can see this contemporary language that we've developed on the extension there. Um, and then you can see in the, the final photograph that it's pretty well uh, uh, exactly as it was on the box. So that's the floor plan there. Um, we've kept the original there. We've got our shadow line connection here. And then this one is actually a, a glazed linkway. Um, and then a, you know, a contemporary open plan kitchen living dining space that connects to the garage, which is on the end of the driveway. Um, and then there's a huge backyard space beyond this and it connects you know, really perfectly. Just you know, walk out of these big doors here um, and then you're straight into the backyard. The other move with this um, property was uh, having a south facing backyard. And it's a problem we come across quite a lot is that um, you know Ballarat being cold as well as old and gold um, has um, you know access to north light is you know particularly important here at all times of the year. Um, uh, so we've got um, this part of the the house. There is a um, is essentially a light scoop. We've, we've kicked up that um, wall to the north, and then we're dragging all that light into that space, and that's what that space feels like internally, and that's what it looked like originally. So it was a bit of a transformation. So I think this is all being recorded. So um, if you do want to go back and have a look through any of that, then um, uh, and if I'm going too quickly, please go back and have a look through. Um, we did um, uh, we didn't really encounter any economic um, issues with this project. We had a good budget to work with. Um, we also had great clients who were really interested in. Uh, allowing us to do some fun things with their architecture. Um, the other weird thing we did have was the uh, planning controls and heritage. So um, Ballarat, building on the boundary, you know, people um, hate buildings that build on the boundary. We had no choice because we needed to get the garage out um, of its prime place in the backyard. Um, but, uh, you know, that's one of these things that, you, that, that in practice, you, you may technically be entitled to build on the boundary, um, but uh, yeah, in the in the middle of uh, fancy suburbs of Ballarat, it can be quite the battle. Um, so the third, uh, third, fourth um, case study that I wanted to show today was um, just a little bit about um, the a project we finished last year in December. Um, and it's called Dalesford 1863, because that is the age of the original uh, building and this was built as a parsonage, which is like a uh, presbytery for um, the the church structure over here, which is an Anglican church, um, and uh, very old building. It's had a lot of work done to it, um, 
over the years to to accommodate it sort of only as a sort of um, the press house but also as various office spaces and there was you know there was a bathroom in the middle of the building that didn't have any natural light and it was um, a bit of a disaster when we came uh, in there to, to, to assess the existing conditions um, but uh, one of the things that was really interesting about it is that the so that's the building at the front which is on um, Central Springs Road but then as you come around the corner it's on a corner block the, the backyard um, had this really low um, structures that, that came out from the back little extension there and um, in this really low um, asbestos um, car, carport. But the the view across the property to the church was considered to be really quite of, of equal importance as the views from, from other streets. Um, and so we, uh, we prepared these, I think, quite evocative um, renders for our clients, uh, for, for the planning application for this project. And um, one thing that we wanted to demonstrate with, the, with these was that we were going for a quite a recessive um, extension out the back. Um, and uh, it, it was sort of in order to create a, a really sort of private courtyard on this side. So all the activity happens on this west and, and north facades. Um, and then on the um, on the east facade, we're still uh, preserving the views in the background to the to the church and the spire, whilst at the same time giving the clients this sort of sense of privacy to their backyard. That's what we were working with. Um, you know, there's these all these horrendous 1990s um, uh, little. I don't know why tiny panes of glass were a big fashion, but it was huge in the 90s. Everybody wanted tiny panes. Um, so yeah, these sort of things are really hard to recycle. It's really hard to to get anybody interested in those these days. Um, so you know, weatherboards can be recycled if they're in good condition, but um, a lot of this stuff unfortunately just ends up either um, in landfill or it ends up um, in in wreckers uh, with you know ten bucks scrawled across the top of it. Um, so yeah. This is a um, uh, just a little diagram, animated diagram of, of what we did to the house. So that's all of the the work that we had to demolish was really only that that back section there, which was an old uh, laundry, and um, we we knocked that off and created these openings within the existing structure uh, in the place of where the old doors were, and then our new. Um, uh, program of the building, all the things that the clients needed for their new house um, was designed to sit into a, uh, a large rectangle at the back of the building. And then in order for that to get north light, um, which is the north sun is on this side over here, we actually took that, uh, that block and we moved it back towards the back of the site. And that had the effect of allowing us to have a, a carport coming into that side there and then a, a private courtyard created on there. Again, same sort of tricks we do on a lot of pro properties, we had the original building with um, bedrooms and bathrooms because we have an existing um, sort of cellular structure in the old house with um, load bearing walls. And um, it's very expensive. It's the, it's the economic Godzilla coming back at you on these sort of jobs um, to say, okay, well, if we want that to be an open plan space internally at the back, it's gonna be, you know, steel lintels and, and really quite gear to, to modify it. Whereas if you, um, uh, your brief calls for three or four bedrooms and bathrooms and those sort of things, they can be really easily retrofitted into these um, old spaces with a bit of love and care. Um, and it's, I think it respects the existing structure a lot better as well. So that was the floor plan um, of this one. And uh, it's, um, uh, I think it kind of shows the, the concept on that corner block really well about that, the courtyard. Um, and then this is the final result. So um, we've got, we've essentially re, reused this old house, uh, which is, you know, wasn't wasn't intended to be a family home. It was all sort of built as, a, as this sort of parsonage, but um, it adapted really well. Um, and it's, I, we wanted to sort of include it in this adaptive reuse and, and reurbanism discussion because um, a building like this, um, we think has this enormous potential for a new life. And the, um, the, the fact that you can create a really contemporary uh, pavilion structure at the back of the house that, that has, um, you know, it's really warm and it's got a lot of north light into there and uh, it's private and, um, and, and feels spacious and modern. Um, and, and that's kind of the antithesis of the, a lot of these, um, these buildings that look like this at the front. 
um, and and certainly if they're extended in a in a traditional style with um, you know with the same roof forms and the same uh, fenestration, then um, uh, you, you you're limiting yourself in, in many ways. But um, if you employ a, a contemporary architectural uh, a language with contemporary materials and, and detailing, you can often create. Um, I think the best of both worlds, you've got all of that lovely old um, parts of the house, you can still retain your weatherboards and your brick chimneys and that sort of thing. Um, and then we've connected those with a, a really simple glazed link. Um, and then we started again, we started a new story in, this, in the history of this building. Um, and there's little things that we celebrate in there, like this is a, a new archway between the old and the new that would, would need to be replaced. And it's kind of in a transition zone between the old and the new. So we used a, a steel plate, which we've bent up to, to, to the exact same radius as the uh, initial arch, sorry, the original arch, which is in the background. As you can see there in that one there. The little, little hints and sort of um, references and uh, uh, almost a little architectural jokes that um, we like to, to incorporate into these buildings. This is the sort of uh, one of those old structures too, because the um, the original laundry, this crappy old nineties um, renovation came through at this point here. And we sort of thought, I wonder if we could keep those big holes that have been sort of gouged into the building and we, and we patched up the brickwork around it and turned it into this sort of semi outdoor indoor space so that um, again, Dalesford's even colder than Ballarat, so it's um, it's a lovely space to to sit in uh, in the winter and have the fire going, which was the original fire from inside, which we cut a hole in the back of and then reversed it. So uh, because the room behind it didn't need a fire, um, and so we're using that indoor fire now as an outdoor fire. Some more shots because they're pretty. So Aaron, I've got a little video of this. We've been, um, just before you play, we've been uh, of late starting to get a film crew in as well as the photographers um, when the projects have been finished because we really want to tell the clients a bit more of the story. I think a lot of architectural photography, um, uh, you, you know, it, it can be manipulated and it can be really selective in what you see, but films much more, um, I think it tells a much more complete story of a building and it's and it's virtually impossible to fudge anything so um, we've been really enjoying uh, working in film but I'll, I'll let this play So um, yeah, I actually couldn't see the film at, at my end there, but um, uh, it's uh, something that we've had a lot of fun creating and um, and trying to tell that story with the flickering uh, shapes of the, of the body in space um, and uh, and using the, the the people. That's actually the the owner um, of the house, and um, she was delighted to be involved uh, as the as our uh, actor. Um, that one again was. Um, 
like a, a lot of our new projects, they're no longer sort of being really hamstrung by the economic Godzilla. Um, and the clients were really cool too. They basically just said, you know, do you think, you know, we really want to see what, what you would do if this was your house. Um, and, uh, so we got it. We, we didn't have any inflexibility, inflexibility or inertia. Um, but, uh, again, those, those planning controls, um, and, and this is why the, the, you know, this, this planning control, um, and heritage Godzilla is really complicated one is because sometimes when the, you're up against this Godzilla, you kind of, um, forced into uh being a bit more creative and, and finding a way around um what it is that the the particular control suggests um and that's kind of all part of the game that that um that we're in and i think that the, the building would have been completely different had we um uh not been required to maintain that view of the of the church across the property um so just uh, moving forward from these projects, um, you might notice that, that a lot of them really aren't um, uh, too difficult. You know, the the the, the elements of um, reurbanism, adaptive reuse um, for residential work and for little things like Mitchell Harris, um, they're they're kind of really accepted. And it's like saying, oh, we're going to do a warehouse conversion and turn that into a house, um, and people are like, yeah, okay, that's cool, um, but. It's actually a really um, an interesting, um, much bigger urban um, uh, design question. Um, and there's um, an architect and urban planner, Jan Gell, who um, was instrumental in the um, uh, transformation of a number of cities across the world um, and, uh, and talks a lot about um, the, the focus of architecture um, uh, being on, on uh, people. And this, um, I like this little quote, but um, we'll keep on running because I'm running out of time. But um, uh, he was involved in the, the redesign of the city of Melbourne um, uh, when it was sort of undergoing its transformation and celebration of laneway culture and, um, uh, and trying to activate the city centre. So when I was, um, uh, you know, moved to Melbourne when I was about uh, 12, 13, um, there, was, uh, there was very little activity in the centre of uh, the city, it's only sort of in the last 20, 30 years that it's really um, come into its own and it's become this really vibrant place. And the, the big picture thinkers like Jan um, uh, are kind of uh, instrumental into the transformation of these places. So there's, um, there's quite a good uh, a video of him with um, uh, that's worth chasing up if you want to try and find that one. Um, but uh, in one of his lectures, Jan talked about the the five good, the five rules for, for making a good city. Um, and uh, one of my five, I'm just going to run through them quickly because um, they're really important. The the idea of, of exploring suburbs, stop building architecture for cheap gasoline um, is is really important. That we continue to to sprawl out into these suburbs because we have. Uh, access to to cheap methods of um, of transport and um, the the environmental problems with this sort of uh, sprawl are huge. Um, but in, rather than kind of concentrating on the negatives, um, this is sort of some of what um, Jan's promoting in, in the positives is that um, in the idea that that you can create and densify a city um, and with its own sort of sustainability benefits by making the city itself a, a driver, making the public life of that city a, dri city a driver um, in your urban design response. Mm -hmm. And that's really about um, activation and, uh, and giving people a reason why they want to be in the city. Uh, design for multi-sensory experiences. Um, so this is a photo I took um, in my uh, second favourite city in the world, uh, Venice. Um, and uh, it's sort of the uh, the opposite of the the sprawling megalopolis. It's this super dense, super packed in. Um, you know, you, you're smelling the sea, air, you're smelling the the odors of the city. You're you know, you can um, taste. You've got you know food. You've got gelati. You've got uh, spritzes everywhere. It's this um, you know the multi sensory experience, and I think that's what probably uh, attracts a lot of people to the city. Uh, making public transport uh, more equitable is another. There's the fourth of Jan's five uh, rules, and um, this is just the the ACTV um, Vaporettos in Venice. Again, one of my other favourite things about the city, um, and that that idea of um, equitable public, public transport is that um, if you you know if you keep on moving out and and sort of just 
um, sprawling with the, with the suburbs. It's, it's not um, an equitable access because of the economic um, considerations of public transport. You, you, it's harder and harder to get to people the less dense that the city becomes. And ban cars, great idea. Um, so Jan's work has been instrumental in some um, uh, European capitals, um, Scandinavian capitals, where the the dominance of the vehicle as as the mode of transport and and the alpha dog in the uh, in the in the city, where this is the street. No, this is for cars. Um, and 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 this whole sort of idea that well, is that what we really want? Is that a city? Is that a, a vibrant place to live where where cars are, are given? Um, this uh, godlike status as they sail through the city, and everybody else on a, on a, on a bicycle or walking can be uh, excluded from uh, from using that that space, that civic space. So, just some examples um, of some lovely projects that we've um, um, just identified for this this lecture that we really want to to get out there as um, as destinations for when travels sort of a more of a thing and. Uh, uh, and some of the ones that we really loved. Uh, so this is Paddington Reservoir Gardens. You can see that street level there. Um, and this was an underground water reservoir at some point. And um, it's, uh, it, they've taken the roof off it and then put in this new uh, steel staircase and, um, and basically turned the whole thing into this public garden space. And it is magnificent. It's one of the most incredible urban spaces and it's dropped down uh, below street level. So you're in a city as busy as Sydney. Um, but then uh, you drop down into this area here and then they've got a couple of uh, deck chairs and, uh, and all this greenery and, uh, and water features and um, people just head down there to read the paper and chill out. It's the most lovely space. If you're up in Sydney, I would say this should be your first stop. It's incredible. Um, the High Line in New York, uh, somewhere I have not yet visited, but um, I've got a, a great book on it um, called Landscapes and Landscapes. And there's a um, uh, there's so much going on with this project that that we love in this studio, um, and uh, and this idea that there is this um, non vehicle street that's being created uh, simply for the people. Um, it's it's a really powerful concept. Um, another one that we particularly like is the Paramount House Hotel, um, which was in a, uh, an old warehouse conversion, uh, mostly because of the, the approach that Breathe Architecture took to the, to the building in terms of sustainability, as well as um, uh, the retention of the existing character of the building. So in some ways, um, like what we were trying to do with Mitchell Harris, um, that, that idea that a, that a building doesn't necessarily have to be re-rendered, repainted um, or, or transformed um, in order to suit a new life, um, that you know you can keep this element of the city largely intact. And to me, it kind of uh, contrasts with the new, but it, it enhances that. The Reichstag in uh, Berlin is um, another really interesting example and, um, and one that we've kind of used in reference to a, a theoretical project that we're working on at the moment. Um, and we'll get to that a bit later on. But um, the, the thing I liked about the Roach as a as a great example of of re urbanism um, is that the you know this this is sort of stuff, stuffy old very um, somber classical building here. But they haven't shied away from uh, an intervention into that, uh, which creates one of the most bizarre and and dynamic spaces that you could ever imagine, um, where the 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 visitor can literally look down into into parliament and and through this mirrored structure can uh, uh walk around look at the views of the city but also see the way the wheels of power that are turning underneath um so in order to um to achieve such incredible um outcomes uh there is a necessary um um, intervention between the old architecture and the new. And that's something that really interests us working in a city like Ballarat, where we have so much heritage and so much um, uh, beauty that in the architectural uh, legacy that we have, that um, to, to propose solutions that are quite um, daring like this um, requires, um, I think, a, a, a really sort of um, um, brave attitude to say, you know, from the community, not from the architects, but from the community to say, okay, well, we've got something great. Could we make it greater? Um, and I think in this case they have. 
Uh, another classic example um, of a building that's been made better through uh, some serious intervention is Tate Modern uh, on the Thames. Um, and this is a, you know, just an incredible space. This, um, the Turbine Hall is um, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest architectural spaces as far as I'm concerned, are these little bridges that connect parts of the gallery. Um, and, uh, and this illuminated box of things. It is um, a, a brilliant undercover space, a great example of how um, an old um, industrial use can be turned into a, uh, a very successful community space and a civic space. Um, and then finally, the of, of these great examples that we love and that we talk about a lot in the studio is the Punta della Dugana, uh, which is a Today Endo building in um, uh, in Venice, again, strangely enough, um, because I love that place. Um, and this is a masterpiece. Um, it's really interesting what they've done um, with the, the old building, you know, many, many hundreds of years old, possibly thousands of year old um, a, a structure of four, um, I can't remember, I think it might have been boat building. Um, and uh, it's been transformed into a modern art gallery. Um, but uh, I love that Ando hasn't really shied away from um, on the, from the heritage of the structure too. You know, I think he 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 believes the same thing that I do is that sometimes these interventions uh, into the structure, such as this concrete pier that comes out, so that the gallery itself can engage with the water in the same way that the Peggy Guggenheim uh, Museum, which is just a bit up the road here on the Grand Canal, um, uh, up the road. Uh, and uh, there's this sort of engagement there with the water. Um, and I think by kind of creating this um, opening in the structure that was proposed for the for the model here, um, whilst it wasn't done in the in the ultimate um, end product, it uh, it shows a I think a, an architectural sort of um, daring and a, and a and a braveness there to suggest that okay if we want to have this which is an incredible gesture for the street or for the Grand Canal where we can open that up and create this dialogue between the inside of this historic building um, and uh, and the main thoroughfare of the city then we are going to need to to take down some of the building uh, interesting that it wasn't actually done. Um, so bringing us to our penultimate case study of our work. Um, so we're at 50 minutes. Okay. All right. This could work. It could be, could be close. Um, the, we were asked um, to do a, we were asked to be part of uh, the invert um, exhibition, uh, architectural ideas exhibition last year from Green Magazine. And um, it was really lovely to be asked. And it's the, it was the invert number three um, a, about laneway architecture. Um, and the site that they gave us was a, a laneway house in Melbourne, but it could easily be anywhere from, you know, the same sort of building in, in Geelong or um, Bendigo or Ballarat. Um, and, the, and the concept was, the, the brief was that essentially that they were going to give us this tiny parcel of land. It was eight metres by 15 metres wide there. Um, and so uh, an area about the size of, you know, two garages um, and, uh, and it would, the idea was to create your, this, your vision for a laneway house in that tiny area there. Um, so as an inspiration, we looked at these um, Korean courtyard houses um, and one of the things, really interesting things about these ones is that they, um, they have this space inside them that is this community space. And it's not really, you know, when you think about a courtyard house or a, or a home that, that looks like this, the, you would assume that all of these spaces look onto a private courtyard that, that belongs to the, to the inhabitants of the house. But these spaces um, in, in the Korean culture um, are often for family, for extended family and the community. Um, and they're not just spaces for um, in that sort of Japanese tradition of that beautiful courtyard garden, you know, with the raked stones and the uh, and that sort of feeling of it being this contemplative, peaceful space. They're often, um, you know, they're often working gardens and uh, and spaces where, where where jobs are undertaken and 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 things happen. There are these sort of vibrant community spaces. Um, and so here we are with our tiny site, um, and we realised that we really couldn't fit. Uh, the sort of building that we wanted to to build on on the back of this building with 15 meters there and then eight meters there, um, and we thought, oh, I wonder if we could sort of grab the street and make it part of our design in some way. And we thought, well, I know they've given us this box to work with, 
but it's a design competition. Who cares? We, you know, we're not, we don't, it's not a design competition. It was an exhibition. Um, and uh, we, we, weren't, we weren't winning anything. We weren't, uh, it wasn't a real project. We weren't trying to, to, um, to do anything other than the sheer joy of, uh, of architecture and design. So um, we, we extended beyond the, the site and cantilevered out over into the laneway. And then we proposed the idea of buying the backyard of the house behind, and then all the backyards all up through, through the laneway to create a, a new housing model that has a public laneway space that goes through the middle, and then a series of courtyards that created uh, across uh, it, between a, a single home, and that might be like a multi-generational home that goes around these courtyards. Um, and then uh, they're connected by roof terraces to the next property um, and by a street below. Um, part of the submission was that we had to build a model. Um, and so the model, um, we decided to go nuts and just you know, build an incredible model. We've got a little um, a CNC uh, machine in the office. So um, we were able to basically draw up our profiles of everything that we did in CAD um, and then put in these little grooves um, perfectly spaced uh, for the, the shading structure that runs around the inside. Um, and then we got a very precise model uh, at the end of it, which worked really well. Um, and then, you know, one of the things I love about, I love about building models is that you can, um, uh, you know, put your phone inside them and, uh, and get some lovely shots uh, without having to, to re-rent. <laughs> um, so there were some beautiful moments that we captured in here just by chucking the phone in there. Um, and it was a great thing to be part of. Uh, and I think, you know, institutions like um, Green Magazine, which, you know, sometimes I'm flicking through and it's like, yeah, is it the latest space in the latest hand? Um, uh, light fitting or, or, or you know, a, a project, a small project that might be off grid or something. And um, but you think about big projects like this and this, these ideas competition or the ex exhibitions, and they're really of a, of a sort of a civic minded organization and, and people who are thinking beyond the architectural envelope into what it is that makes our cities uh, great places to live and, and what we can do with that densification. Um, and uh, so, you know, to be part of this uh, exhibition, and I, I urge everybody, if you can get along to one of these, if they run uh, Invert 4.0 at some point, it's really great, you know, it's really stimulating. And it's, to me, it was like being part of our, our own little Venice Biennale uh, in Melbourne, just a, in a micro version. Um, and it kind of inspired us to um, continue doing these projects because we really enjoy uh, speculative um, ideas-based projects. So rather than having a, a client uh, come in and say, oh, I've got, you know, $635,000 to spend and I need to do this, this, and this, and this, um, you know, that that is what we do every day. Um, but it, we need to, it's a, you know, you need a little bit of a, of a uni studio project in some ways to to keep um, the, those the, the architectural um, ideas fun. Um, uh, another thing that, that we found really um, quite interesting was um, Monique um, Woodward from Wawawa, um, who had many years ago, she talked about this at a presentation um, a couple of years back, that um, she, back when she was starting a practice, she wasn't sort of, she was interested in getting these projects and, or, 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 you know, testing out her architectural skills on these, um, on these great houses that she'd found. Um, and so she started her own little uh, YouTube channel called um, If You Are Mine. And uh, she she would just sort of turn up. It's worth looking at. Worth tracking down. It's really great. The um, uh, this whole idea that she's just sort of found this property and then she's gone. You know what? I'm going to talk about the architecture. I'm going to talk about the design of this um, of this project. Even though I haven't been engaged, uh, she does it from the street. She's not. Um, she you know she's not the architect for that project, but she just wants to have a shot at it. Um, and we found that to be uh, really inspiring. Um, and this is an image from uh, early on in the lecture where we, we uh, talked about this John Wardle building and um, uh, in Ballarat, you know, this is a hundred million dollar big massive thing that's, that's um, uh, you know, really great for the town and it's great to see um, uh, the, that company, um, you know, doing a cool project like this in Ballarat. Um, one thing though that we, we thought th is that it, it kind of um, perhaps uh, lacked a bit of foresight in creating uh, a civic space at the front. You know, there's, there's a civic hall project over here, but it's only sort of got sort of a band of, of green space around it. And this project here, if it had been uh, allowed, I think, to go a bit higher, um, could have created a, a central um, uh, town square for the city of Ballarat. So um, just going back to the aerial photograph for a moment and looking at the, at the city, you've got um, 
a really interesting view when we um, look at the, the sort of zoning. So that's the commercial district in the center of town. And then these um, areas that we've just taken and put back into color um, are sports fields that, that dot around the perimeter, uh, sorry, the, that run around the perimeter of the, um, of the central uh, activity area. You've got Lake Wendery as, um, as a sort of a, a really popular recreation space um, and then um, various other sort of um, nat natural spaces that sort of come in on the edges of town. Um, the other interesting thing about Ballarat is so we've got this big central boulevard, which is Sturge Street, which is where our office is located from those original slides at the start. It's up there. Um, and uh, Sturt Street's this, this really interesting place. It used to have trams running down the middle of it. Um, and then for some reason, we got rid of them. Um, and uh, and it's this, I, I liken it to the idea of a front yard. It's this space to look at, but not really to use because it's uh, it's this, this huge road that runs down um, both sides. So we've got two lanes plus parking, sometimes on both sides. So, you know, with the parking plus two lanes, plus um, sometimes parking in the inside back here, um, you've got four lanes of traffic and, and plus two lane, more lanes of parking. Um, and that makes it this sort of island that sits in the middle of the city. But uh, as this um, shows, it really is, you know, the only green space in the centre of town. Um, you can imagine if we're talking about densification um, and, and wanting to live in these activated, thriving, thriving, dense cities, um, that one thing that we need is, is green space. You know, we can't uh, have a city that's going to grow up and uh, you know, have hundreds of thousands of people and, and trying to have a dense core without having anywhere to, to meet and to, to enjoy the out, outdoors. What we do have is this tiny little bit in here, which is the Camp Street um, uh, green space. So it's this sort of a uh, little bit of um, fortuitous uh, open public space and that just sort of happens to be in the centre of town. Um, Searle Waldron um, did this uh, incredible um, annex project a few years back um, that was big. It was on the cover of Architecture Australia, I think. Um, and it looks out onto this space. So we've got not only we've got this really cool um, sort of micro urban open um, square area over here, but then we've got this cool covered space in Ballarat, you know, miserably cold half the year. Um, you, you do need these um, covered areas to, to really um, have hold, sort of hold these community events and allow them to spill out. Very successful project, but very tiny. Um, so this is the city of Bendigo at the same scale in a aerial photograph and their central green area, which you can see through here. Um, this park is unbelievable. It's a great, you know, you go for walking for hours and through there, you know, it's so many little bits to discover and it's, and it's just beautifully set up. I uh, went to the Bendigo Beer Festival there back a few years ago and they had little bars and things set up and around it. And, you know, it, it can have massive events. It, it can have um, uh, this sort of inner, uh, civic sort of role to play within the city. Just so it happens to look like Godzilla. I've just noticed that on the side. It's in your head. Uh, entirely coincidental. Um, and But if you compare that insides to the central um, Ballarat uh, civic space, then it's just, you know, it's, it's hilarious. There is no um, possibility that, um, if, you know, if this is considered to be an attractive urban idea, um, uh, for, for a city that's going to grow, then the city of Bendigo is far better placed uh, with, with that level of green space at the centre of town than the city of Ballarat is. Um, so that just is black and white to just show that a little bit more. But um, we, it got us to thinking, um, where, are the, where are these green spaces in Ballarat and um, uh, what's going on in them? And um, the first one that we kind of really identified after sort of scouring through the, the aerial photographs of our fair city um, was this site here. And um, it's a really interesting site. It's a, uh, it's, Ballarat has these two massive cathedrals, St. Pat's on one side and St. Andrew's Kirk on the other, um, uh, other side of Sturt Street. Um, St. Pat's is still a, um, a, a, you know, a, a community church, it's a Catholic church that's still in use in the community. Um, whereas the one on the other side, um, isn't being used at the moment. This is uh, a picture of the cathedral, St. Andrew's Kirk. Um, and uh, you can see it's one of these very old, very um, beautifully executed um, cathedrals. It's one of the tallest structures in Ballarat. It's got a real presence to it. 
Um, it sits on Sturt Street here. So you can tell, you know, that, that idea of this being the front yard. We've got all our monuments and our rotundas. Um, and then, you know, th there are no signs that say keep off the grass, but uh, people keep off the grass. Um, and uh, and this is St. Andrew's Kirk here. Um, this, you know, it's, it's incredible, Nick. What a, it's a beautiful building. Um, and then there's all these associated the little buildings out the back, some of which have heritage protection, some of which are little sort of lean-tos and things. And then the empty sort of block, there's another empty block at the back of here and another block here. Um, and uh, we kind of identified that this was a really important um, potential asset for the community. Um, the This is just another view of it from uh, looking uh, from Sturt Street sort of back towards the side of the church. Um, you can see even though from an aerial photo, it looks really um, like there's, there's a lot of this green space here, it's not inviting. There is this um, heritage protected cast iron fence with bluestone footings. There is this, this vegetation that is all very much um, stay out. It gives you that sort of sense of stay out. Um, but as the city of Ballarat changes, uh, so must it's, institutions. Um, so this is the 2011 census data um, of uh, people in Ballarat specifically uh, and their, their religion. Um, and uh, that's a change from 2011 to 2016. So you can see the biggest religion on the rise at the moment is having no religion at all. Uh, nothing stated is still the uh, about uh, the same. Uh, we've got a lot of Catholics that are coming over from Catholic to no religion. Um, and then all the other ones um, in town are also diminishing slightly as well. So the Presbyterians who are the owners of St. Andrew's Kirk um, uh, are becoming an even smaller sort of section of this, of this wheel, um, which is why it was sold um, a while back after um, some negotiations with various um, other churches and, um, and interested parties that was sold to uh, a local developer um, for a price of somewhere in the vicinity of a, of, of a couple million bucks. Um, now, that is really interesting because to me, in my mind, I'm thinking like, this is a cathedral. This, this is a, a building that was built originally as this community asset. Um, and then to have it sold to um, a, a private property developer, um, and, and, and it's since changed hands, it's since actually sold from one property developer to another. Um, and we've got this sort of, um, hot potato uh, asset that's it, somehow this this massive building in the middle of the community, but it um, um, it's been sort of in the in the hands of people who may or may not um, really have the the best solution at hand for what to do with it. Um, so we thought, well, well, we'll have a crack ourselves. Why not? Um, and so we we uh, appointed ourselves the architects and uh, and um, the. The bosses of this job in in a theoretical exercise um, and we we made up a, a quick model of the building in sketcher and uh and we started to sort of wonder about what we could do to um to change this um this building uh, a bit the way in the way that monique uh would have done for her, um, her little web series um we thought well we could um, we could do the same thing but on a, on a bigger scale um, and the first thing that we've uh, we've thought about in this project is that despite the fact that this this fence enjoys heritage protection, um, it's unsustainable to have a uh, you know this the the largest green space in Ballarat unusable because of a heritage control. Um, so our proposal would be to re to retain parts of the fence to document it and to um, and to retain parts of it in on the site, but ultimately to remove it so that we can create an interface between this massive green area and the and the community around it. The second thing that we want to do, and this one is sort of the, the the controversial, a bit like a Tadeo Ando's um, intervention into the Punta della Dogana, is the idea that um, these buildings, these old buildings in Ballarat, they were never designed uh, for what we now know about building sustainability and, and um, creating structures for people. Um, yeah, of course, everybody knows that, that having windows is a lovely thing to do, but you know, technologically, um, uh, it, it wasn't possible at the time to design a cathedral that, that had um, significant um, daylighting. So that's one of the things that we found about this building that is very old and dark and, uh, and that doesn't work for living in Ballarat as we've learned from our smaller projects, which is why I talked about the smaller projects, a lot of the time you need to, um, to, to learn the lessons from these smaller ones as you, as you progress. Um, 
the next move that we thought was really important to this would be to, to somehow um, open up the sides of this cathedral as well, you know, and, and again, it's an ideas, an ideas uh, exercise. It's not, um, we need, don't need to worry about steel members holding up rooms. We don't need to worry about any of the things. We just wanted to sort of say, okay, what if, what would happen if we, we blew out the sides of this building um, uh, and to create an opening there that would allow the community to, to feed into the structure? The other thing that we thought would be a really interesting idea would be that um, the building um, uh, could actually engage with the landscape. So if, we, if we're going to invest and, uh, and create a green space for Ballarat, there's not necessarily um, uh, the, the accepted sort of boundary between inside and outside. Now, a lot of the time with our residential work, we're often um, asked, you know, how can we bring the, uh, the landscape into our house? You know, can we have a flush threshold so that we don't have to step up um, or down to the deck? And um, can we have these full height windows so that we can feel like the gardens in this space? We're doing a house at the moment, which, um, which is, has this little step down, which is filled with um, rocks around the perimeter. So that the glass kind of just disappears into the rocks um, uh, and that's the same treatment on the outside as in the inside. So it's again about sort of dissolving these boundaries um, and really trying to push that idea of bringing the landscape into a building. So we thought we'd try this sort of approach as well with the uh, with the architecture uh, of the um, of St Andrews Kirk. Um, this, the, the other thing, which is more of like an economic sort of um, uh, step in this project, was that we thought, well, you know, if this property is in private hands at the moment. There, there's a bit of a, you know, uh, a standoff there because the community won't let a property developer come in and turn this into an apartment building. It's just not going to happen. You know, it's heritage protected. Um, and that is not a, a use that the community is really, um, you know, going to benefit from. So th we've got all this uh, extra land over here. And I think the strategy that we should be developing it and working with the developers, I, don't, I actually don't even know who they are, but we, um, we should find out, um, is that we should be using um, the, the sort of a, um, a, a carrot in that we could develop part of this land either, you know, I think there's a, there's a vacant block here or certainly this back part of the block here or parts of the block that, um, that aren't uh, of such an architectural significance. They could be developed um, in, in, and could be quite high in, the middle, in their location. It could be, you know, almost a, a, a significant sized tower. Um, and the height limits on that could almost act as a sort of a trade-off between, okay, well, if, if you're willing to give 75% of the site back to the community as this green space or this public square, then we will let you go to eight storeys. Or if you're going to give us 65, well, then you can have six storeys. Uh, and then to try and sort of use that as an economic lever to uh, achieve a, a social outcome. Um, and then really the final step of, of what we've been thinking about, and this goes back to, to Jan's uh, five uh, rules for making a good city is that um, Sturt Street for, you know, in, in that black and white photograph for, for a very long time has been the, um, uh, at, at, dominated by these two massive um, uh, boulevards of traffic, you know, with horse-drawn traffic, it was trams, now it's just cars. It used to be um, the, the main route to Melbourne, but then we've got the ring road now, it's, you know, it's been bypassed. This is now uh, a four lane highway in the middle of the city with a public park in the middle of it. So our proposal is to, um, to create a, a, a multifunctional public square in the middle of town um, and to expand over from that area into uh, all the way through to into the middle of uh, Sturt Street. And that by doing that, we're going to create a green space that will, um, a, a public space here that will um, be multifunction. It'll, it'll, it'll be, you know, we've set it up at the moment in this, in this view as a um, farmer's market. Uh, it could be there for uh, concerts, you know, um, public uh, art installations. We've got some Jeff Coons I work over here, some Richard Serra work there. Um, we've got uh, the the existing um, uh, monuments and um, a green space that runs through the middle of Sturt Street there. But all we're asking is that traffic is just diverted around there. A minor inconvenience uh, for a for a huge social gain. So um, just to show you what this project might look like, um, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Aaron just to, to get it started. It's a little visualization that we've prepared.
uh, stills that we've we've taken from our 3D model um, just to explain some of the concepts and those moves. So it, as you can see, we've got the, the walls opening up, we've got the um, the green space coming inside. We've actually punched it through in this very provocative sort of idea there that, you know, what's stopping us if we we're taking down heritage fences, then we can punch a hole through a heritage roof for, for this idea that, you know, we're going to create something in this um, in this sense that it's a uh, in this iconic um, or or really experimental building this this asset that we're saying no we we understand its heritage value but we're we're not um, we're not being constrained by it we have the um, uh, the willingness to to play around with it in order to achieve the goals that that we as the community would like to achieve. Um, so yeah, just some some uh, contemporary art sort of uh, installations that happen around the perimeter. So we've got these steel um, archways that that sort of square arches that we've used to open up the sides. We've got this um, architectural um, archway element here that sits um, on the side of the building, but without going into it. Um, as you move sort of into the structure, uh, as you've probably just seen in the animation, um, you've got this internal space and. Um, one of these things that uh, Heritage Victoria um, are really sort of interested in is the idea of an ongoing use of the building. Um, and we thought that this would be a really interesting, um, and it's related to that, the, the statistics of, of the use of a building is that as Ballarat um, has um, enters a more sort of secular period instead of it being uh, dominated by religious institutions, um, if the current trends continue on, then um, uh, this might actually work as a as a multi-denominational worship space, um, including for um, you know uh, atheists. You know why not? It's an it's an incredibly beautiful space. It could be for people who uh, who don't specify their religion or don't consider themselves religious. But you can't argue that a that a big uh, cathedral filled with trees is not in some way an uplifting or sort of semi-spiritual space. Um, and that's just sort of looking down back towards the city of Ballarat, Mount Warren Heap in the background. Um, and then this idea that this um, great big green space that, that could um, occupy the city um, would have many uses, um, including um, uh, at night where it could be uh, well lit and, uh, and used for night markets and that sort of thing as well. Um, so going back to the theme of the lecture, we fully anticipate that this project could come up against some Godzillas. Uh, there is a small chance. Uh, in fact, all of them. And uh, we uh, we anticipate that um, this sort of thing is um, really uh, a a fanciful project. It's it's the idea of, of designing for the sake for the fun of designing. Um, but also, we've got it. I mean, there's a strong message behind it. And um, I like this little quote. This old Latin proverb is that the the cat wants to eat fish, but doesn't want to get her feet wet. Um, and by this, I'm saying that as a community, if we want to live in more sustainable cities with that definition that we talked about at the start, which was that dense, walkable, thriving streets, then we kind of need to get our feet wet. We need to propose solutions and to work really hard to implement them. Um, against the forces, uh, mostly of inertia, of, of not wanting to rock the boat, of not wanting to do anything because it hasn't been done and that that's not the sort of thing we do. Um, the forces uh, of society, um, you know, I, I don't think Godzilla's there. A lot of these Godzilla's are consciously trying to to have a negative impact on the, on the community. They're, there are reasons for these institutions and for these policies and, to, uh, and for these attitudes to be in place. Um, you know, in Australia, we're really sort of indoctrinated into this don't touch heritage places. You know, this is a heritage building. We can't change it. Um, that in some ways that it's dropped out of our architectural and urban planning discussions that we, in fact, as a community do own these, these buildings. We own these places and we get to decide their future. Um, so, yeah, rather than not talking about it, I think... Um, we we deliberately try to, to to in in a Ballarat sort of community way, uh, just to poke the bear, and um, we've we've developed a, a deliberate deliberately controversial concept um, for Ballarat because at the end of the day I think it's up to architects to uh, to start a conversation um, about how to create a better city. Thank you. a bunch Mick what a great presentation um, 
it was really lovely to hear your your personal touch shine through the whole thing. I particularly enjoyed the image at the beginning there when when you spoke about enjoying the the character of the Mitchell Harris project in its functional form. Um, and yeah, at the end with that creative exercise for the Ballarat Cathedral, it's um, it's really nice to hear as a student that you're still exploring creativity and and what you called fanciful design solutions. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's just uni. <laughs> <laughs> um, in your in your professional career, it's it's a it's a nice nice vision for us yeah, as students to kind of have to look forward to. Um, so now we're going to throw it out to the audience and see if we can get any or see if anyone's interested in asking any questions. Should I um, stop the screen share there, Aaron? Yeah, that that'd be great if you could just pop that off. Um, so we're going to throw yeah throw it out to the audience and. Me and Robbie will take turns asking questions. Uh, I think Robbie's going to kick it off with the first one and we can get started. I sure will. Thanks, Katie. Um, okay, uh, so Mick, we've got a question here from our friend Josh. Um, he says, thanks for talking again, Mick. It's great to see the new work that's come into the practice since you last spoke. I think the idea of working in film is a great way to explore other mediums of architectural media, both for your clients and as an exercise for the practice. As a practice with projects across multiple publications, what do you think architectural media as a whole focuses on too much and doesn't focus on enough? Cool, yeah. Um, you notice how whenever somebody in a public situation now gets a question and they go, hmm, great question. Uh, that was actually a great question. So I'm going to say, mm, great question. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's not just me who thinks, oh, some of the things I've been reading about um, architectural uh, representation is that um, we, we focus almost exclusively on the image um, and, and the, the, the visuals of a project. Um, and I know with film, it's still a visual medium, uh, but the, the we, we we talk about architecture through the ideas of oh that'll photograph well or, or this will um, uh, this could be a cover image or something like that and um, it's this you know it's a bit of a, a grotty way of of describing architecture when there are so many um, other senses that um, that really make a, a particularly nice building um, so even with my fairly modest um, extension that the the wooden box house at the start um, the way that the building uh, looks to me isn't nearly as important as the way that I experience that space and um, and how that sunlight comes through uh, every morning when I walk down there in my socks and um, uh, sit in that window seat and uh, the, the the little things that I've got that, that the Jules and I have, have got right with that building the things that make us smile uh, aren't necessarily sort of the the image because in a way that's um, again what we're saying it's, it's easily manipulable and it's um, uh, it's not really it's not really architecture it's like you know when we, we pour a lot of people who in, in uni and something you know pour hundreds of hours into a presentation because you're making architecture but you're not you, you're making drawings of architecture and and i think photography in the um in this sort of image obsessed culture is about um images of architecture it's not actually about architecture architecture is um, uh, is an experiential art form. It's the most experiential art form. It's, it's an art form that you live in, that you work in, that you that you move through. Um, and that's one of the things that we really wanted to capture by um, by using film is that the, um, and in particular, that's why I showed that one at Dalesford is that it's the, to me, that that feeling of the body in space and um, and almost that memory of, of inhabiting a space and, and leaving a trace as a, as a history, sort of an element in there. Um, that's really, um, I think, about that deeper understanding of architecture and, and how it relates to people. Um, and that's why we're not trying to do a real estate video of, of the houses. Like we, you know, you'd see on realestate.com.au or something like that, that um, we're actually using um, creative filmmakers, um, Luke Keys, um, uh, Alyssa and Heath at, um, at Mass Motion in Ballarat. So they're a Ballarat film crew and they they um, are extraordinarily um, uh, talented, but they, they, they work across the field and they work in, um, um, Heath is, is an incredible composer. And so he's actually written the music uh, for these 
pieces. So for that film, you could hear that the the sound uh, had this sort of ratcheting sort of uh, motif that came through. So that was about somebody who was trying to understand the concept of our architecture, the concept of the film about the body in space, and then composing music to that architecture um, and then bringing it all together. Um, it was incredibly incredible privilege to be part of a part of that. And, um, and that's why we do it. So um, yes, I don't think there's nearly enough um, architecture being represented in um, uh, in a sort of a non-visual way or in the non-standard visual way, which is magazines and websites. Um, all of that, you know, Instagram and uh, Facebook and, and, and blogs about design, it's so digestible and, you know, you just throw it away. It's, 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 uh, it's so fleeting, but um, at least with these films and um, we're, we're working towards entering in, into this couple of international um, architecture film competitions, um, transfer one in uh, uh, Switzerland and there's another one in Canada. Um, and as we sort of make these films and get better at, at that, at doing that, we want to um, engage with that, you know, as, as a sort of an extension of our art. That was probably the longest answer I've given to any question. So uh, sorry about that. <laughs> No apology necessary. <laughs> it's uh, good to get the in-depth answer. And, and it's really nice to hear, you know, in such a, a visual time when we're living online, especially at the moment, that there's other ways of expressing the, the forms around us. Um, I'm going to ask a question from Mitch in the audience. He says, oh, he's got two questions, actually. He says, hi, Mick. Thanks for your presentation. I have two questions. Then would a client have Godzilla traits and resist? the juxtaposition of contemporary design with heritage architecture and how do you respond to that and then his second question sorry I, I just cut out a little bit there was the question um do we have godzilla clients in and something about heritage architecture would you mind just rereading yeah i'll go again sorry right. so he said, how often would a client have godzilla traits and resist a juxtaposition of contemporary design with heritage architecture and mm -hmm. how do you respond to that mm -hmm. Um, do you want to take that Great. one? And then go yeah, down. let's do part by part. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the the thing that we do, um, and uh, we're we're really, um, uh, I think, conscious of this at the start of the project is that we we kind of interview the clients at, at the start to make sure that um, they have seen the work that we do and they they understand that we have some things that we won't do. So if they're, uh, if we get the sort of a hint that they're going to be a Godzilla client about uh, resisting contemporary architecture and, um, and going for something a bit more traditional or saying, okay, well, we've got to have the existing roof line continue, um, we'll say things like, well, we actually, we've never done a traditional, you know, kids drawing picture or pitch roof sort of building. Um, why, why is it that you came to us to, to get one of those? Because that's not something that we offer. You know, you don't, you don't go down to the Toyota dealership and ask for a Porsche. You don't go down to the Porsche dealership and ask for a Toyota. You know, we don't we don't produce that. I don't know which one we are, but um, I I I sort of say to clients, you know, we can't give you that as a result. So what you need to do is go and talk to this person, and we refer them on. Um, and we would much rather do that because it's a win win. We don't have to have uh, a Godzilla client, and we also um, give that client, you know. The, the respect that they deserve and 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 the better outcome and and instead of setting up a situation where we're going to bang heads um we would much rather see that client happy and and uh and getting what they need yeah, absolutely it's just like referring them on to to who they really wanted to see in the first place it's a good way of thinking about it so we um we have about a five percent turnaround in inquiries to new jobs well okay so like, there you go Here's another I second part to that question. More. Yeah, I think you did. And there's a few more parts. It's, it's a long one. So <laughs> um, he says, also, how would you suggest that we begin developing our own sense of heritage to a city when it is so restrictive? Should our gold rush cities always reflect the 1850s and 1930s? Yeah. Um, we use this as an argument in our planning, just sort of planning applications a lot, is that we, we think it's an entirely reasonable architectural position to take in that the builders and uh, the designers of uh, Ballarat's rich gold rush architectural legacy, these, these incredible buildings, they must have been designed, they must have been contemporary at some point. They must have been designed by living architects who were trusted to not destroy the city. And um, uh, I believe that 
the the architects of today, um, given the same uh, responsibility, will create buildings that, uh, you know, in, in another 150 years, it's, it's, you know, it's a building that was built in 2022 by, you know, Luke Stanley or, uh, or Nathan Porter. And this was a good building and it's something that, that deserves protection. Um, and uh, one of the things that we do in the, in the Ballarat um, Architectural Communities, we've got this um, Ballarat Architects Group uh, where we meet and we, we try to, um, to you know, support each other and, uh, and work together in this, that um, particularly um, in, a, in a small city and, and one that um, uh, doesn't have you know, a huge number of contemporary architectural um, work on display in, in the community, um, we, we need to kind of, I think, band together to demonstrate why that's a good thing. Think that hopefully will satisfy the questioner, and then that, yeah. <laughs> although we do have one final part, which is um, is separating our cities into designated period blocks of urban sprawl instead of a natural progression of architecture, creating inadequate livable cities, and is this reflected in smaller Victorian towns' protection of heritage, also resisting yarn gals cities for people? And he says, "Thanks from a Bendigo." Near. So um, yeah, I think the um, um, yeah, there's there is this sort of um, golden handcuff situation through the city of, of you know incredible beauty like Bendigo or Ballarat um, in Geelong. There's there's this established grid. There's a there's a, the, the vehicle space. There's this um, sense that the, the that the city has been constructed this way, and that's why it's good. And that if we were to interfere with any of that, then that would necessarily be bad. Um, and, and again, I think it probably goes back to the, the, the end of that lecture there is that I think it, part of what we do and part of what we should be doing in the community is to, is to occasionally poke the bear and to say, you know, we haven't spent a dollar on this. We're just showing you an idea. And this is a, this is a future. We're imagining a future where this uh, heritage situation doesn't exist or, or, or we uh, are, are mature enough grown-ups to, to understand that we own these buildings, we own the, the city and that we are the masters of, of its future. So we get to decide which bits that we keep, which bits that we change. You know, there's um, the, the, the fence that surrounds St. Pat's uh, in Ballarat is, uh, is one of the, sort of the biggest uh, loud fence um, movement um, uh, installations in, in, in in that particular movement against um, the church's um, child abuse um, uh, problem, and um, the, the this, this this structure, which has become sort of this you know unintended guerrilla monument to um, uh, to to the to the survivors of abuse, is a really um, interesting thing. And it's about to me, it's about okay, well, the the community, like it or not, uh, have gone and. Um, and I like it. I think it's a bloody great thing. Um, they've gone and taken this this heritage truck and this heritage fence around the church. You know, in this symbol of division between the church on one side and the people on the other. Um, and then in this sort of really subtle and um, uh, heartbreaking um, uh, sign of protest, they've tied ribbons to, to around the, the entire cathedral's uh, fence. So, you know, when when we have these institutions that protect the community that are designed to protect heritage, they only work up until a point where we stop letting them work. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Mick, I've got another question for you. Um, on your website, and I'll just quickly give you a, a quick plug here, it's maloneyarchitects.com.au. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, I'll expect the check next week. <laughs> yeah. um, you speak about the design and test system used in your practice, um, where at the end of each stage, the design's priced and costs are estimated, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, when did this process become a key part of your practice's work? Mm -hmm. And how do you see it influencing the client and design across the project lifespan? Um, does that help to tame one of the Godzillas, do you find? Yeah, yeah. So, um... I'm actually a pretty sensitive soul, and I can't stand um, the idea of uh, of a, an upset client who's come to us and said, "Okay, well, I've got five hundred grand that I want to spend on my new house," and then going to tender and it being eight hundred thousand dollars, and 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 then being you know heartbroken 
and, uh, and I think it gives architects a bad name. Um, and uh, so what we do is that we work really closely with cost planners. Um, so these are professional quantity surveyors. Uh, it comes from my um, experience as a commercial architect previously to being a residential architect with lots of experience doing uh, large projects. And, um, you know, commercial practices use quantity surveyors all the time to help them to um, uh, provide the, uh, advice to the client um, on, on the cost of things. Um, it's less common in, uh, in residential practice, but um, in, as our projects sort of, um, some of them are into, you know, four and five million dollars now in, in these residential, single residential properties. Um, now that's the size of a, of a decent sized commercial project, uh, especially in the regions. So um, uh, it's absolutely essential to use it to the quantities of that. And, uh, and what it does is that it really um, allows you as the architect to be completely aligned with the client. And so that you can say, okay, well, um, what we're going to do is design something for you for the budget that we think that, you know, the, the, the sort of size and quality and complexity that we think you can afford with that budget. And then we're going to test it with a, you know, a qualified numbers nerd who sits there and just does nothing but spreadsheets. Um, and, uh, and I love them. They, you know, they just, they're so matter of fact, they're great. And they will give us a, 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 a figure that we can then say to the clients, look, the, 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 the boffins have uh, estimated that this is, you know, 200 grand more than you can spend. I think we should get rid of the lap pool. I think we should get rid of the helipad. And then we'll be bang, well, and so. Um, and, and that allows you to have those conversations in a way where you and the client are very much aligned in your interests. Um, and sometimes the client will go, no way, I'm keeping my helipad. I'd rather, you know, get rid of the double glazing. <laughs> and, uh, and it gives, and it opens up that conversation. And um, to me, I find it just to be, uh, I say that the quantities of AI is the most uh, important consultant in, in getting a project actually completed. Everybody's got a budget. Everybody uh, has priorities within their budget. And it's up to you as the architect to work with a professional cost planner to um, not and not just sort of go, oh, I've got a gut feeling it's going to be all right. No, that's bullshit. You've got to work with somebody who can do those numbers if you can't do them yourself. Uh, and I'd say 99% of architects can't uh, do an adequate cost plan. Uh, you just don't have the training for it. And um, uh, we we do it on 100% of our projects. And I have to say, it, it makes the process so much better. To, to listen to more tales from practice, <laughs> I uh, I have started a blog with my uh, good friend, uh, Warwick Mahaley and uh, Kate Fitzgerald, who's from uh, Whispering Smith Architects in Perth. Uh, Warwick's the... Um, uh, co-founder of uh, Mahaley Slocum Architects with his wife, Erica, and um, they, uh, and with all three of us have sort of got together now to, to record a pilot of our blog. So look out for it in all good blog shops. I don't know where the blogs go. Apple, yeah. iTunes, something? Yeah. Probably. We can, we can put it on our blog as well. Yeah, cool. It's, it's anybody cool. can find it there. It's called In Detail, and uh, we'll be discussing uh, architectural practice uh, questions like that. And we'd encourage, um, once we've got a play act together and we'll put it up on our socials and we're going to encourage students and other architects and everybody to, who's interested to, to ask us questions uh, about practice because we find that answering them um, is just as important as, uh, as, as asking them and, uh, and we're really sort of all uh, business nerds in that way. Great. All right. Uh, so looking at the wooden box uh, mullet house, home office, Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned how you enjoy this compact living and that most of the world already lives like that. Can you see the Australian dream uh, moulding to a more conservative use of space in the future? And is that something you attempt to encourage in the visions of your clients? Yeah. Well, I, I think the Australian dream of, um, of, of how it was defined in the 70s of the quarter acre block has been dead for, you know, generations. It's, it's you know, we've got people who live in tiny apartments in the city. We've got um, various, you know, other um, modes of living. There, there are um, tiny houses. There are uh, container houses. There are, there are so many varied ways that people live that this idea of having a, a big double garage and a, and a suburban house, um, it appeals to a lot of people, but um, it's certainly not the whole of uh, the market. Um, we have a, we live in the, in the middle of Ballarat on Sturt Street and um, our house is about 50 square metres for the, for the office, about 60 square metres of sleeping zone and then another 60 
the 70 of uh, of living space out the back um so it's it's tiny you know we, we've got a family of five living in about 120 square meters 130 square meters and it's um uh compared to most of our clients houses which are you know 250 300 square meters and um it's uh it's fine you know we, we we're perfectly happy here um and our house would be palatial compared to an apartment in hong kong um and uh so we um uh i think that 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 um that idea of the the australian dream um it's as it's as wide as there are um models of housing now and ways of living and um the uh the, the this sort of idea that, that compact living has to be some sort of compromise to to a lifestyle um it's a nonsense you know that, that you can't you can't have a quarter acre block in the middle of the city So touching on that, and then a few other things you mentioned in the lecture, like the Invert 3.0 project and how you talked about Young Girl from earlier. And then we saw an image of the urban sprawl at Ballarat at the start of your presentation. I was going to ask a bit of a topical one about higher density housing and, and what you think, do you think it has a role in regional Victoria or, or Australia? And would you consider those kind of programs with, with a bigger number of families or living residents in, in maybe in Ballarat or, or regional cities? I think it's inevitable. Um, and I think if we look at the demographics and the trajectory of population growth, um, and then particularly with COVID now, um, people have worked out that most of their job can be done on the computer. You know, you don't need to go into the office every day. Um, and I think that that is going to change the, uh, the way in which people not only think about their, their life uh, in, in a professional sense, but also in that personal sense about, you know, where, where do I have to live? I, I was thinking about this a few years ago about the, the advent of the electric vehicle and if the, sorry, the autonomous vehicle. So if you were, um, you know, living in a, in a farm somewhere outside of, um, you know, Ballarat or whatever, and you worked in Melbourne, you could get up at seven o'clock in the morning, get into your autonomous vehicle, um, and then have another nap as it drove you to the, to the office and dropped you off. Um, uh, you know, and that and that sort of idea in the in the future would be like, oh my god, um, you wouldn't need to. You could live anywhere you want. You just you know, travel wherever you needed to as you slept. Um, and uh, and I remember that sort of blowing my mind. And then really, as COVID could have come in and and shown the community that we we maybe not as um, uh, essential to uh, to the you know to to being in an office. Our role isn't to one hundred percent just face to face contact. Um, it's really changed, I think, a lot of attitudes towards work, and um, what that's going to mean for Bendigo, um, Ballarat, Geelong, uh, Surf Coast, um, or you know all of these other big centres across Victoria, is that um, the reason to live in Melbourne will be um, because it's a lovely city not because I have to live there because of work, because I think this, this is going to be a real game changer. Um, and, uh, and that's going to mean that a hell of a lot of people are going to be moving um, to their regions and they're going to be looking for all different types of housing. Um, and, and, you know, like we talked about before, this, this Australian dream, um, a lot of people's Australian dream is very different. And um, some people will, I mean, in Ballarat, we're doing the first, um, our first Nightingale project um, and uh, it's, you know, a couple of blocks from the, the train station uh, in an old um, industrial sort of area. Um, uh, it's a really interesting um, build and, um, and selling like hotcakes because um, it's, there are so many people in, this, in, the, in the community that want a low maintenance um, social um, house that, you know, is close to, to the, you know, facilities close to town. Um, but also has a sense of community, shared gardens, shared laundries, that sort of thing, where, um, you, you know, you might move from your, your big house on the lake or whatever um, and then uh, and, and come into these smaller um, uh, apartments, not because, um, you know, you've lost all your money or something, but because that is a, a more attractive way of living. And I think we're going to see uh, a lot more of that in regional areas. But um, one of the, you know, the, these Godzillas that are in the way of, of this bit of, of city's transformation are, um, are not just sort of finance, uh, heritage controls and all that sort of thing. It's, it's about um, inertia. And that was our third Godzilla is that the, the idea that we, you know, have done things in a certain way, we're not going to be able to do that exactly the same forever. We're going to need to adapt. Um, and, and one of the things we're going to need to do is to uh, imagine 
what that future looks like with those buildings. Speaking of imagining and adapting, and uh, you spoke highly there of, of young girls' cities without cars. Do you, do you think there's a possibility of that happening in, in Ballarat or Melbourne? Um, it's, it's unimaginable that um, people in Ballarat would give up their car. Like, it's just, it, you know, we, every family that I know has uh, at least got one vehicle. Some of them go down to one, uh, but um, I don't know anybody in the city who has who doesn't have a car. I met one woman at a community consultation night who lives close enough into uh, Ballarat East that um, she doesn't own a, own a vehicle. Um, but, you know, we literally have it in our planning scheme. It's enshrined that if you build a house, you've got to have two car parks. Um, what about people who don't want that? It doesn't allow for that. It's, um, you know, I know that's everywhere, but it's um, it's got to change. Agreed. Okay, um, Mick, this is a question more from me, I guess. Um, do you have any aspirations of turning Maloney Architects into a, a global mega firm with Mick Maloney, the star architect? Or, <laughs> um, or are you, you know, do you really enjoy the residential aspect of architecture? And, and why, do you, why do you feel drawn to that? Um, yeah, it's it's something I, I, I grapple with because um, an architectural career for me isn't just this sort of uh, linear trajectory where you go from doing smaller work to bigger work or you're not famous to being as, you know, Bjarke Ingalls or you, you, you are here to there. Um, it's really interconnected with the rest of my life as well. So when I'm not being a, an architect, I'm uh, with, you know, uh, three kids and I'm trying to be a dad and I'm trying to be a husband and and uh, develop other parts of my life that aren't necessarily architectural. And right at the moment, living in uh, a city the size of Ballarat and, uh, and working on the projects that I'm working on is extremely satisfying um, and extremely convenient and that it fits in with all of my other life goals. Um, I literally work at home. You know, I live on the main street, but I've got this really small, sustainable model of living where We've got a small house, low maintenance. We've got a low, very small mortgage. We've got um, uh, a great professional life. and We've got a great personal life because my kids can come in in their jammies at, uh, whenever they're going to bed if I've got a late night at work um, and we can hang out for a bit because uh, of that sort of um, model of living that we chose. Um, so, no, the answer is definitely not. I'm 100% I'm staying where I am <laughs> for the short term and not um, going to become a a global uh, architect, but um, uh, you know the, the future is always you know interesting. I I, I would love to, um, to to undertake a project overseas. I'd love to um, to do something in Venice. You know, it's, it's, you know, deeply passionate about that city and about the people that, that I know there, and um, and the, the the Venice Architecture Biennale, which again, you know, for any students out there listening or, or younger architects. That is the you know the pinnacle of you know you're not in, not only in this incredible city with this incredible experience, but then these people have set up literally acres of cool architectural uh, models and presentations and videos and installations and you know there's uh, you anybody who's uh, been on the fence about going to that you've got to go it's just incredible. I don't know how I got there, but yeah, we got. <laughs> No, it's understandable. <laughs> I think I think all of us as, you know, architecture students, we find out about, you know, different competitions or different events or all those kind of things. And then we kind of geek out about it and have the dreams of, yeah. you know, winning it. And then, you know, what's life like after that? But yeah, um, on, a, on a more, I guess, reasonable tangent, um, as young architecture students um, and on our topic of sustainability um, do you have any advice for us in um, how we can approach those in our projects uh, advice for a, a an architecture student do you say for, for incorporating yeah yeah for students or young architects you know just emerging in the field yeah and look i um I'm really interested in, in the pragmatics of sustainability and the um, uh, building technology side. Um, I work closely with um, uh, a, 
colleague Owen Doherty is passive house certified, and um, we we often talk about thermal bridging. We talk about um, you know the, the way in which this building would would cope with being um, blower door tested, and, and, and all of these passive house things that really um, are interesting and important to our practice. Um, and I find that that sustainability um, as a as a conversation often hinges around these um, technical questions, and I think that's a really um, erroneous sort of um, uh, system because uh, as you guys have identified in the subject of these topic of these lectures is that the you know the, the sustainability as a concept is bigger and and, and as architects we've got this uh, responsibility for efficient and energy efficient buildings but that's one thing and then there's the idea of social sustainability as well um, and that's something that, that I find uh, even more interesting is uh, you know about the city that we live in um, and the and these sort of a little bit more nebulous concepts of of architecture being a a vehicle for sustainability um, in a in perhaps a less sort of nuts and bolty sort of way and more of a, a theoretical sort of way and I find that there's a really rich vein of of, of study and, and um, discovery there that you can um, you know that again architecture exhibitions and design weeks and things that you can you can go to and, and be exposed to these you know bigger concepts um uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful field to be in that you can um follow these these parts so my advice would be to um keep an open mind about the um non-technical side of uh, sustainability there we go and on that note i'm gonna wrap us up this week uh, we, we managed to, to keep it kind of in, in some reasonable time limit there. And I'd really like to thank you, Mick, for, for taking us through that insightful lecture and the questions and, and sharing your valuable time with us tonight. So My absolute thank pleasure. Thanks, Katie and Robbie and uh, Aaron. It's, um, it's a great, great uh, privilege to be asked and um, uh, we've, I've really enjoyed um, preparing and providing the lecture. So keep, keep up the good work. Yeah, particularly enjoyed the, the Godzilla element of tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and just on a little update from the Reels, if you have been following us week by week, we're, we're taking a little break for the next few weeks, and then we'll be jumping right back in with a lecture from Ken Maher, from, who's a fellow of Hassel. Um, and so just to finish up, thanks from the Real team to Mick and everyone who, who joined in tonight and asked questions. We're really excited to continue bringing you the real lectures and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.